Ronnie. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you for joining me. Thank and, you. <laughs> and first, so my first question is, you live in Melbourne in Australia. I personally have never been in Melbourne. So I want to know what it's like to live there and what's the city like? Melbourne is an amazing city. I, I adore it. I think it's the best city in, in Australia. <laughs> and I have been to a few Australian cities, but um, it's, very, it's very laid back. Um, it's got lots of cafes and uh, food places and chocolate places and yeah, it's just it's just a lovely city to live in. <laughs> I suppose we're all prejudiced. We all love our own cities, but yeah, I just think it's the best city. But that's what I that's a, the perfect description because that's what I've always heard. How I've heard people describe Melbourne, so kind of makes me want to go there and be the judge of myself. <laughs> you should just don't come in winter because it's freezing. I, was, I just came from Scotland, so I feel like oh, yeah, I might be You'll be fine. <laughs> so your first ever book, Dancing with the Devil, came out in 2000. Yep. So that was 20 years ago. So you've been writing for 20 years, which is an amazing feat. So I would like to know how, why, how, where, where did you get the inspiration and how did you then transition, like after writing the manuscript, to deciding to pitch to agents and publishing houses? How was the process for your first book for you? Um, well, first of all, I started writing when I was 12 years old. So I've basically been writing most of my life. But I didn't get serious about it until around 1990. I, I, that's when I had my daughter and I thought, well, you know, babies sleep all the time. I'm going to have all this writing time. Um, didn't quite work out that way, but... Yeah, I did, I did a lot of um, writing and just um, practicing, uh, writing what I love. And um, back in those days, it was a very different um, prospect because we had to, uh, we didn't have the email option. We actually had to send physical printed manuscripts overseas, which was, you know, 90 bucks, 100 bucks at a go. So you really had to be very certain that, um, you know, your book was good enough to be published. And I, I sent it to Bantam and a few other places overseas. I also sent to Australian publishers, uh, entered contests in Australia. Um, I got good feedback, but kept getting told that while my books were sellable, um, they couldn't see an Australian author with an Australian setting being a success in Australia. So what? that's basically the moment I said, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> that's basically the moment I said, stuff you. And I went overseas, you know, just started applying overseas full time. Um, and then I got, um, then I heard about a small e-press called uh, Imagine and just emailed them and got a, yeah, yeah, send it. And they actually rejected the manuscript first off. So I, I wrote to them and said, well, you know, if I made changes to the criticisms you had, will you have a look again? And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did that, made all the changes and then sent it back and they accepted it. But that was 10 years from the from 1990 to, oh, it's actually 1999 was when they accepted. So, you know, nine years uh, between first deciding to be serious about my writing and then eventually getting my first contract. And it was just, you know, sending it out, getting rejected, rewriting, get sending it out, getting rejected, throwing it to one side and, and starting a new book and yeah so yeah it was just yeah learning process and how long did your first book take you to write because obviously there's nine years we've got there between from when you first started deciding to make your career well it into a career and then getting a contract so there was a lot of time in that and I absolutely love that because you are a very successful Australian author and it's really nice when you hear obviously self-publishing nowadays comparing to 1990 and to now it's very convenient to self-publish everyone can have it immediately yes. whereas it just shows that even a couple of years back in in the publishing world it was a different world entirely and you had to you had to wait or you had to make it work so how many years did it take you to write the book and how many years do you think that you had to go through um, letters of rejection until you finally you hit that right publisher for you oh, I think well, the, the book I kept sending out was the fourth book I wrote. I will never send out the first three. They will never send the lot of day. I've looked at them a few times and thought, oh, God, no. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the fourth book took me about a year and a half to write. And then I spent the next, well, basically the next eight years 
um, in between writing other books, going back, editing it, sending out, getting rejected, putting it to one side again and coming back to it. Um, and it, it was all a learning process. I mean, every time you, you write a story, you learn something. Every time you edit a story, you learn something. And I think that's what a lot of people aren't doing enough of these days. They aren't giving themselves time. You know, they write their first book and they put it out. You know, you've got to give yourself time to learn and, and improve your craft. You know, you may be the like, one of the lucky ones where, you know, your first book is perfect, but for most of us, that's never going to happen. And we need to, to, we need to learn our craft and, and how we write, understand how we write uh, and stuff like that. So, yeah. Okay. Another good question. So, and I hope this isn't rude. Yep. Uh, did you, when you started writing, were you writing, was it physically pen to paper? Was it typewriter or was it computer? Um, you first started writing? I've done a bit of, I've done a bit of handwriting um back in the early days and then we got a a very basic computer um i can't even remember the name of it but it was just you know a little basic computer that was basically just a word program and yeah. that's what I, I typed out on that yeah so yeah computers are very different these days let me tell yeah. you <laughs> well, <laughs> thank your god whole, your whole process would have changed over the years because again you've been here you've been doing this for 20 years so you would have chopped and changed a lot to like actually, sort of go with the trend no my process actually hasn't changed that much i still I'm still a pantser. I still wear enough pants my stories and I still, I set myself targets and I write to those targets every day. So my process really hasn't changed. I don't chop and change. I write from beginning to end, straight through, go back and edit. So yeah, so really the process hasn't changed. The way I do it like on the programs and the computers and everything like that has changed. You know, email submissions, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's all changed. But my process actually hasn't. And it's been, yeah. you probably write a lot quicker now, I'm just assuming, but because you've published now 48 books, isn't it? Yes. Which is yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, so I guess going from when your first book took you a year and a half, how long do you think averagely now it takes you to write a book? Three months. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I aim for about 90K to 100K words and it's three months. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'm just so excited. <laughs> it just does for you. <laughs> You're amazing, so I'm so excited about all of this. Okay. So your first mainstream book was published in 2006, yep. uh, Full Moon Rising. So I, I want to know, I want to know how that was going to a mainstream publisher because for a lot of authors these days, especially indie authors, it's very not far out of our reach. But as you said, we have to, we have to you know, wait it out or, you know, work really hard towards it for years. But also this was one of the books and series that gave you so many awards and you also hit uh, USA Best Selling. Um, New York, did you get New York Times yep. as well? Eight yeah, times. like <laughs> how many times? Eight times. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to ask how the first time when you had that experience, because that is the goal and target for a lot of authors, you've now had that eight times over. But how, how was the feeling of sort of getting, getting that, getting to that, that goal and that level and recognition? And were there any other awards that really, really touched you in your career? Um, well, New York Times is just amazing. It's, um, yeah, it, it's something nice to put on the covers of your books. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I always, because I'm published with, in America, or was published in America, you always get the news via email. So it's just a matter of opening emails and going, oh my God, I hit the New York Times. You know, it's sort of like that. It's a delayed reaction. And then you, then you go in and you take, you know, photos of all, all the things. So you've got proof that I was there once. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's just an amazing feeling. The best feeling ever. So. Uh, as for other awards, I do like the reader ones. Um, like I've got a few um, Romantic Times Awards and they're, they're amazing because you know the, the readers and uh, the Australian Romance Readers Awards I've got a few of those and they're always great so yeah. I have a question actually so you sorry we keep going a bit off topic but I just have yeah, yeah. questions for you um, I, I've met you at the first time I actually met you was introduced to your books was at a signing event and I was wondering do you do a lot of international signings um, I used to when I was trade published. Uh, I used to go over to the Romantic Times um, convention most years, uh, mainly because my biggest market is in America, 
and the romantic times they were you know massive um, massive conventions three or four or five thousand readers in one event so yeah and they had a big signing and and everything like that so i used to go over there once a year but other than that no i don't go over it, it gets too expensive yeah uh, yeah So as we were discussing, you've now published 48 books, which yeah. is just mind-blowing. And to be able to write consistently as well, one book every three months is just phenomenal. So do you have any routine or tricks that helps you stay cons like consistent with those deadlines? Um, I use a program called uh, Pacemaker, uh, which you, it's basically you input your start date and your finish date, and it works out how many words a day you've, you've got to write. And I just, I just basically do that. And, you know, if you don't hit your target, you, you put in how many words you did add and then it readjusts all the other figures. And if you're not careful, you watch those daily word counts go up and up and up and you go, oh, dear. <laughs> so it's sort of, for me, it works for me because I, I sit there looking at the figures going, oh, no, I don't want to be writing two or 3,000 words a day. So, <laughs> so I, I do that. But my routine... My, ba my basic routine hasn't changed. Um, I sort of, in the mornings I do my emails, take the dog for a walk, um, and then I write in the afternoon. So, and I usually write about 1,200 words a day. Yeah. And that gets me a book done in three months. Wow, and so how long do you reckon it's sort of, so you put aside maybe an hour or two every afternoon? Is that including weekends? Um, no, I take weekends off. Weekends I use to catch up. If I'm behind or I've got edits coming through or stuff like that, I use my weekends for that. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, I just write until I've hit my target most days. And it could be two hours, it could be six hours. So it just depends. I'm gonna look Sorry, my that dog's sitting here distracting me. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 So what's been the most surprising opportunity for you in your career? Um, I actually don't know that I had many surprising opportunities. Um, it, it's harder because my main, main market is in America and it's been an Australian author. You know, I don't get a lot of the opportunities that the US authors do because my pub publishers would never pay for me to go over there or anything like that. So um, it's kind of been restricted. You know, I've had, I've had interviews with people and everything like that, but yeah, not... Nothing surprising, nothing you wouldn't expect as an author. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I guess so, nonetheless, the awards and the New York Times bestselling is not surprising, but still... An, an well, it is surprising, but, you know, I wouldn't call them opportunities as a, uh, a product, particularly New York Times, of the, uh, the publisher's marketing and, and how they release the book, because um, what they did for me to hit the New York Times is they... Uh, released four books in quick succession. So, um, so they had um, three books, three months in a row, and then they hit the fourth book, I think a couple of months later. And the build up to that was me hitting up, hitting the New York Times. So it was a result of their marketing and um, the build up that they did is the reason why it hit the New York Times. It was, sort of wasn't a surprise, they were expecting it. Of course, you know, it could have fallen down, but it didn't, so. Yeah, that's amazing. Obviously, the, they know what they're doing with marketing. From a um, author perspective, did you see after that? Because I, I know a couple of indie authors who have hit it um, once or twice, and so it definitely gave them an increase of sales afterwards. But after a couple of months, it sort of receded once again. Did you did you notice that yourself, or it remained pretty consistent in that sense, or um, did do you think it really affected your sales massively for that year? Um. Trad publishing, um, it remained pretty consistent because I was releasing two books a year with Trad anyway. So, um, so you, you sort of had that push every six months anyway. With self-publishing, you do get the fall off. It's just, it's just the market. You know, you, you have a fall off after two or three months and that's just the way the market is. You've just got to, so that's why they, you know, people recommend that you have at least three books out a year if you're going to self-publish because that's the only way to keep keep the money momentum and the marketing momentum going. So, because you do, you just do get the natural fall off after three months. Which I I completely agree because I actually last year I when I moved to Scotland I had a bit of a break. 
Yep. So I, it was nice, but it was also a bit of a mistake because when I've now this year come back into it hard and strong, I've noticed that massive decline in my sales and trying to get the momentum again yes. for it because I hadn't released anything. It definitely shows. So I think you're right with the three books per year formula. I think that makes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 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 So the first time I met you was in Riveting Reads in 2016 and I loved your cover. So I actually bought Blood Kissed yep. and I devoured that within, I think it was the, the day after actually. <laughs> and I, I fell in love with you. Like you are such an amazing person to meet in person as Absolutely. well. And I, I had only been around for about a year or two and you sort of took the time of day to talk to me, which I really appreciated. And I was a little bit fangirling. <laughs> so back then we discussed, um, you were talking that you were just about up until that point you'd been traditionally published um, and you were looking actually going to independently publish. Yep. Since then you've now published 10 books um, indie and I was just wondering what do you think the massive difference is? What are the pros and cons of both and do you have a preference? Um, well first off I was actually pushed into self-publishing in the end because I lost both my contracts, my trade published <laughs> contracts so in the end I had no real choice. Um, the differences between the two is, is, is pretty simple. It's the, as a, a self indie, you have to do it all yourself. You know, you have to arrange all the covers, which is actually pretty cool. Um, all, all the editing, the copy editing, the proofing and, you know, the marketing, which I don't do enough of and, um, you know, handle it all yourself. Whereas with trad publishing, they do, they handle, you know, most of that and you really only have to concentrate on the writing and occasionally doing a bit of marketing. So it was a massive learning curve. Uh, for me and I wouldn't have gotten through it without my mates who'd already been there done that so um, yeah so it was just now that I know what I'm doing I'm loving it but it was just such a huge learning curve and it would be for anyone who comes out of the trade environment like I, I did um, it does take a fair bit of learning but uh, yeah I love it I love you know having control of the covers and being able to change prices and react to the market with none of which the trade publishers do with any sort of speed. So yeah, it's good. <laughs> How do you find the marketing aspect of it? Because I know a lot of, into, you, it's not, it's not easy to write a book, but that's, that's the first step of it. And then everyone sort of struggles afterwards with the marketing aspect of it. How do you find it? I'm really bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually, I'm luckier than most because I, I have been published for so long. I have got the following behind me. Um, so I actually don't do a lot of marketing. Uh, and I also don't agree that a lot of it is necessarily the thing to spend your time and money on. Um, I think in the end, what matters is your books and getting a backlist behind you and getting your books out uh, consistently. Um, You've got to have a newsletter, you've got to have a website, you've got to have, you know, social media and all that. You've got to, you've got to have all that. Um, but I, I've never done ads. I keep meaning to do courses on it, but, I, you know, but I've never done them. And I occasionally do a, a um, send out a, a book bub, pre-release uh, alert and a release alert and all that. But, um, yeah, I'm really bad. I, I'm not the person to ask about marketing because I don't do any of it. <laughs> It's good too because sometimes simplicity is the best way to look at it because I know for myself, like sometimes I overcomplicate it when I really don't. I'm looking into Instagram um, algorithms and such and it's not always necessarily. And you're right, you need to get a backlog. You just need yeah. to focus on that following. Have a nice website, which you do. Your website's beautiful. Yeah. Um, have a nice website and a newsletter and just make sure you're keeping in touch with your readers. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, a mate of mine, um, she's been in the business almost since, you know, the early, you know, what was it? Oh, I can't remember. She's been in it for about 10 years self-publishing. So she was one of the origin originals. And she she doesn't do a lot of marketing. You know, she doesn't do any of the stuff you're supposed to do. And she's making big money uh, by simply releasing three and four books a year. And she's done it constantly for, for 10 years. Now, now that she's got a massive backlist behind her, she's making good money, really good money. And it's it's just by having good books that readers want to read and having there constantly. So, and, and I think that's really the, the only secret to it. I think so. too, um, the attitude maybe when people are going into self-publishing specifically as well, because I know everyone's very impatient with the results and you're right, as you said, your friend's been doing it for 10 years now. She does have that consistent yeah. backlog. She'd have 30 to 40 books now. So they're going to continuously be selling. Whereas I think people, 
expect to publish one or two books, do a bit of marketing and in a year or two be making a hundred thousand plus a year. And it's not exactly really. Well, no. I mean, once upon a time, if you had three books self-published, you could, you could start making decent money. That's now gone up to six or seven or eight books before you start making decent money simply because um, the market's so saturated now. So, you know, and it's, it's, you know, you've got to have good covers now and you've got to have, your books have got to be edited. They've got to be readable. You know, you just can't expect to not pay money for a decent edit and, and have the readers flock in. If you want to make the money, you've got to spend the money in logical places like your covers, like editing, like proofing. So, yeah. And I want to... Market. <laughs> I love it. So I want to quickly ask actually about your covers because you do have very stunning covers and you're very consistent. Like I know I can look at one of your books and go, that's Carrie's, that's Carrie's book. So do you, in regards to your concepts, to your um, book design, do you know straight away what you want or do you think that you do mix a little bit with what the current market is? What, what book themes for your category? Do you stick with that a little or do you just think this is how I want it to look and we're going to go with that 110%? Well, I write urban fantasy, so there is a set ex expectation with covers in urban fantasy. So I stick with the expectations, but I also play around with them. Um, and sometimes I know what I want and sometimes I see a pre-made and go, oh, my God, I need that. Uh, so um, my latest book, uh, Blackbird Rising, was a pre-made. And I, I just looked at it and the whole story came to me. Because I'd, I'd been vaguely thinking about a King Arthur, sto you know, theme story, and I saw that cover, and it just went boom, and it was there. So, I, you know, so now it's going to be a trilogy. But yeah, so it's just things like that. Yeah. That's amazing. And that one, that one's just released, hasn't it? Or is it on pre-order? No, no. Uh, Blackbird's out since February. February. So okay. I'm writing the second one now. Amazing. So that'll be out three months. <laughs> I hope. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> So what would you say the highlight and the hardest part of your career has been so far? Highlight was, um, well, it's kind of two. It, it, it was getting the first traditional contract because that was amazing. Um, it was, it, it, again, because I'm in Australia, hey, with, oh, with, a, tra with a traditional publisher. Yeah. Who, who was your traditional publisher? Um, Random House Bantam in America. Yeah. So, um, my, um, agent was sending it out and I didn't expect very much. And I got this email saying, we've got th three publishers interested. We're going to have a auction. I thought, oh, okay. And you know, we, I think we we're up to 20,000 a book or something by the time I went to bed that night. And then when I woke up the next morning, I got all these emails from it and the amount just kept going up and up and up. And I'm going, Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, we ended up at 120,000 a book and I, that was definitely a highlight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So that, that was definitely, and that's what allowed me to, to, you know, work full time as an author basically. Um, and the other highlight was definitely hitting the New York times for that first time. I mean, it's just, just amazing experience. You know? So yeah. And what would you, what would you say the hardest part has been? Um, uh, learning how to cope with the expectations of traditional published, uh, being traditionally published, you know, the, the timelines and the frustrations that come with it, uh, learning to cope with all that. Um, I did end up in hospital after that first contract, which is just stress, stress related, because I was also still working at the time. So I ended up in hospital with the stress of just trying to cope with the contracts and everything like that. Um, so I think it was, it was that was the hardest, just learning to cope with the expectations of being traditionally published. And, and I mean, I'd, I'd been published with Imagine for five years, but it was very different process and very different expectations and, and stuff like that. So yeah, that was a huge good learning curve. So would you, so I'm sorry to hear that obviously you went through that. Would you say that after winning the deal and contract, that sometimes it's a lot more fast paced than you expect or there's a lot of different departments that are wanting things from you and that's sort of what made it more stressful? Um, I think I've put a lot of stress on myself 
you know, I was just trying, trying to work, having a young family, and then trying to keep up with the deadlines and everything that the, the publishers wanted, you know. It, with traditional publishers, it's always hurry up and wait. You know, you could be waiting six weeks for them to send your edits and then they want them within three days. You know, it, it's it's stuff like that. And and when you've got a family and, and you're working split shifts, it's, it's yeah, it's hard. So and it was just an, a huge adjustment to cope. But, you know, I, I learned a lot. I mean, I'm the writer I am today thanks to that whole process. So. And you coped and look at you now. So. Yeah, yeah, I coped. I survived. Yay! <laughs> What are the strong underlying messages that you have in your books? And do you consciously thread them through? Is there any sort of underlying themes or concepts you like to incorporate? <laughs> themes is something that I, I never consciously do, other than uh, writing strong women who, who, you know, who kick butt and, <laughs> and then ask questions later. Um, there's no conscious themes. People seem to always find themes in my work, but it's, it's not something I do consciously. It's just, I'm there to tell a story. Um, and you know, to hopefully stories that people enjoy. So, um, I just don't, I just tell the story. I don't consciously put in themes or, you know, anything like that. I just tell the story. So. Where do you find a lot of your inspiration for your books? Is there any particular, is there one specific uh, way or anywhere and everywhere? No. I have a very weird imagination. Um, I sometimes get ideas from um, images, I see. Uh, like there was one time, I've told this story before, so people may have heard it, but uh, there was one time I live in an area up in the, the Great Divide in, in Victoria. So we get a lot of fog. And there's, um, between us and, and town, there's this uh, hill called Pretty Sally. Now, it gets a lot of fog. So the, one day, one morning, I was driving up Pretty Sally and it was heavy fog and I'm going really, really slow because I couldn't see the road. And then the, the fog in front of me started swirling weirdly and it really looked as though someone was walking through the fog. And then this line just came to me, I've always seen the reapers, you know, and it's just the whole story unfolded from there. And that, that was the Dark Angel series, you know, and it just come from this imagery and this, this swirling fog. And it's, yeah, so it's, it's things like that. And Dreams, the second book of the Riley Jensen series, the opening of that was a, a dream I had. So, you know, yeah, very weird dreams I do have sometimes. So, yeah, it's just, I just, you know, I, I, I have an image or, you know, a scene in my head. And that's basically how I go. <laughs> Amazing. Sorry, I've just had to put my charge in. It's giving me a warning. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like 10%. I was like, oh, sorry. Um, that's amazing. So it doesn't matter who, what, where. Just no. go with it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's quite often I've been driving out, going somewhere, and I, this idea hits, and I've got to pull over and write it madly down. And, yeah, so. Yeah. You always carry around a notepad now? I do, I do. I've got them in the car, I've got them in my purse, you know. <laughs> yep. So, yep, yep. <laughs> so, I know I keep saying it, but you have 20 years of experience, which not a lot of authors can say that they have. So, I really do idolise you in that sense. I've been very lucky. And I, well, no, I think luck sometimes has a small part to do with it, but if you're an amazing storyteller as well, then it is what it is. Yeah. Um, so my, my question, I guess, is what is the advice that you offer to, I don't know, budding authors or even authors who say, such as myself, have been in the industry for, you know, five, six years uh, and want to take their work to the next level? What's the advice you have for those authors? Um, the one thing I've always advised is to write what you love. Don't worry about what the market's doing. Um, you know, don't worry about what's popular now. Just write what you love. Um, it's the one thing I've always done. Uh, sometimes it's helped. Sometimes it's hindered. Um, I mean, writing what I love is half the reason why it took me 10 years to get published. But it's also the reason why I got my traditional contract because there was nothing out on the market at, at that time, quite like the Riley Jensen series. So um, 
And I think to have any uh, length of career in this business, you've got to. You've got to enjoy what you're doing and, and just not worry about what the market and is doing and stuff like that. Writing what you love is, is the basic thing. I, I think a lot of people forget that message as well because when you get caught up in the web of it and the things that are constantly changing in the market, then you sort of start thinking market-minded as well and kind of lose your identity and brand yeah. a little bit as well. Yeah. Oh, well, the thing is, you know I mean, you are going to be doing it for a long time too, hopefully. So you do want to be enjoying what you're writing, you know. I mean, I love urban fantasy. I love heroines that kick butt, which is why I write them. You know, I love, I actually physically enjoy writing. You know, it's just, I still do enjoy it. After 20 years, I still love writing. And that's, I think that's part of the key too. Uh, what do you think the biggest misconception of being an author is? That it's easy. <laughs> You know, that, you know, anyone can sit down and write the great Australian novel and, you know, be published and make, make millions. Um, it's not that, it's not that easy. You know, it's, it takes a lot of hard work and dedication and learning your craft and persistence. And, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's the biggest, but it's, it's anyone could write a book. No. <laughs> And I think too, like having the courage as well, because it's really difficult to one, decide to write a book, to two, think, okay, I'm going to try and put this in front of people, but then also receive about 20 to 50 different forms of rejection in different way and still persist with it. Yes. Yeah. Persistence is, is vital. Um, more, more so back in my day than, and, than these days, because, you know, anyone can, once you've written a book, you can self-publish it. So whether you get readers or not is another matter, but you know, it, it, at least people these days have the option of self-publishing. Whereas back when I started, we, it just wasn't there. So you you sort of had to either persist or give up. Uh, do you do you think if perhaps if self-publishing was an option in the nineties, do you think that you may have given up on trying to get a contract with an agent and then a traditional publisher earlier? Probably not because my goal was always to see my books on the shelf. That's the one thing I always wanted to say. Um, and it, it, it took me quite a few years to get there because it wasn't until I got the trade contact with Bantam that I actually saw my books on the shelf because Imogen were basically an e-publisher who did print as well. So, yeah, but it, it's I, I would have persisted because I wanted to see my book on a shelf. Yeah. I just wanted to walk into a bookstore and see my book, which is another amazing experience, let me tell you. <laughs> you are everywhere in bookstores because every bookstore I go to, you're on the shelves and it is it's amazing. Yeah, it, not so much these days because a lot of bookstores won't uh, put uh, self-published books on the shelf. Yeah. But you um, have, Even when you have, you're, you're a well-known name as well, do you still have issues with that? Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. They're not going to do it. Yeah, yeah. Unless you um, unless you allow returns with Ingrams, uh, they won't put your book on the shelves. And I refuse to allow returns. They'll they'll order it in. I do get a lot of print orders from bookstores and everything like that, but uh, they won't put it on the shelf because it's a risk. Um, you know, for them, if they put it on the shelf and but it doesn't sell, then they've got they're stuck with it. You know, it's money down the drain for them. So. I guess they might have become a lot more stricter in recent years with ebooks and Kindle becoming such a massive competition for them as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can understand it, which yeah. is why Booktopia getting into ebooks is actually a good thing for self published authors because, you know, Booktopia is well known in Australia and now that they're selling ebooks as well, it gives us another market to, okay. to sell through. Yeah. I don't actually know if I'm on Booktopia. I'm oh well, if you're on Kobo, if you're on Kobo, you will be, because Booktopia has joined with Kobo to um, sell books and eBooks through their website. So I'm going to check that out straight after yeah, this. Check that out. It's all there. <laughs> That's um, Okay, so. You said you weren't exactly pro at marketing, but I'm still going to throw this question out there. Yep. What would you say your three secrets to marketing would be? Good covers, um, newsletter, uh, constant releases. 
Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's a solid proof plan, though. What? Yeah. How yeah. often do you um, send out newsletters? Oh, I'm very bad at that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm random. I I only send them out uh, when I've got something to say. So, like, uh, if I've got when I did the box set or when a new release comes out, or um, the one I sent out recently, I was advertising the fact that I'm giving away books on my readers group. Um, so, you know, things like that, just interesting things. I think the one problem with newsletters at the moment is everyone's bombarding readers with newsletters. And I think you can get lost in the, in the, the crowd. So if you only do it when you need to, um, I think they're more likely to, to open it up and check it out. Make sure you're giving them value instead of every. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I ate this week. Yeah, no, don't do that. <laughs> okay, cool. So the author community is a very supportive group network, and I was wondering if, because of that, you've ever done any side projects uh, with other authors, or just something that you never thought you would have done, but because of the network that you built, you've ended up doing. The only thing I've ever done that I didn't think I would is public speaking. I hate public speaking with a vengeance. Really? Um, and I, I ha yeah, detest it. I, I, I'm so nervous beforehand. Um, yeah, I feel really sick and I shake. And but yeah, I, I do a lot of lot more public speaking now than I, I used to, and you know, get on panels and stuff like that. But um, that's really I've never done never done projects with other authors and stuff like that, mainly because I'm a, cro a control freak, you know. Uh, uh, when it comes to my world and my characters, um, I don't share very well. <laughs> How are you going to go when you get when you get a movie uh, contract? How are you going to go with that if they want to change stuff? Uh, well, they can change, pay me big money, and, you know, they, they can have the rights and do what they want. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> It was, um, I was just listening to a podcast uh, last night um, that Disinterest Sullivan, one of my friends, she hosts, and they had this exact conversation as to whether you would uh, give up basically your, your rights and how you would go with them changing characters. And she was completely opposed to it, whereas her co-host, Caleb, was like, how much money? Doug, do what you want with yeah. it. Yeah. And you really are one of two authors in this. Yeah. Show me the money. I agree. I agree. Yep. Show me the money. You can have it. <laughs> I'll write another book. I'll write another series. Yeah. So what novel are you working on at the moment? Um, I'm working on the second of the Witch King series books, which is my King Arthur theme book. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm working on that. It's due to be finished at the end of this month. <laughs> yeah. Says the computer and the word count. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not meeting targets. I'm having to work on the weekends because I'm not meeting targets at the moment, you know. <laughs> what, um, what has been your favourite book or series to write? Um, I always like the book I'm writing on, working on at the moment. But I, if I had to name a favourite, there would be um, the Nikki and Michael series, which is my first ever series published. And then, of course, the Riley Jensen series because it, it was the one that allowed me to to become a full-time author, you know. So, yes, it, it will always be my secret favourite. <laughs> so what is your dream? What is your next goal that you want to conquer in your career? Um, I'd, I'd like to keep writing three books a year and, and still earn a comfortable living. Um, stretch goal would be a movie deal, but I just can't see that happening. Uh, the way that things going at the moment, but yeah. So stretch goal is movie or TV series, but yeah, just to keep going as I I can and publish books and live comfortably. <laughs> so I have a couple of little quirky um, questions at the end. Yep. So my first one is, who's your favourite author to follow? Um, I actually don't follow that many authors. On, uh, like I follow all my mates, who um, most of whom are writers. I would say Stephen King. I quite like Stephen King. Um, he's quite funny at the moment, particularly with happening, what's happening over in America. But yeah, he's he's probably the only one. Most of my favourite authors are dead, so <laughs> I had to follow them on Twitter. <laughs> Stephen King will stick with Stephen King we'll as the answer. <laughs> <laughs> what's one country?
country that you haven't visited but you would like to? Switzerland. Really? Why? Oh, it just it just looks amazing. You know, all those mountains and snow and I do travel quite a bit, so I, I, I make it a thing to try and go overseas once a year. I don't think I'll make it this year with the virus and everything, but yeah. But I haven't been to Switzerland yet, yet and I'd love to do that. I would also like to do uh, Italy, so see what, Rome and all that. Um, what is, what's been your favourite place to travel to so far that you've been? Um, two places, Ireland. absolutely adore Ireland and Norway. I love Norway. Did you see the lights? No, I didn't get to the lights. I did a cruise, so so we did a cruise around Norway and then we did, you know, daily excursions and everything like that. But it was quite amazing. I'd love to go back there and do, you know, all that sort of stuff. Because I never, I never actually knew that you were a traveller yourself. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm going to <laughs> Love travelling. <laughs> so do I, I'm like, hello, soul sister. <laughs> What's one quirk that a lot of people don't know about you? I think everyone knows everything about me. I've been around for 20 years. <laughs> I've never been shy about answering questions or anything, so I don't think there is anything. <laughs> no weird singing in the shower or five cubes of sugar in your coffee? Oh, I don't do sugaring. I don't drink coffee. Ugh. Oh, Even okay. though most of my wow. heroines do. That itself is a quote that you don't drink coffee. I'm sorry, we're going to have to end this really short. <laughs> Most of my heroines do, but I'm, a, I'm a, a tea drinker, a green tea drinker. I main, I mainline it. It's, you know, there's never a cup of tea out of my hand, basically. And this will be like the title of this interview. Kerry does not drink coffee. No, friends yeah. don't. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> yep. I love the smell of it. But the taste, it just goes, ugh, no. <laughs> you put a sweetener or something in it. You no, don't no, like it. no, it doesn't disguise the taste. <laughs> Do you drink alcohol at least? Oh, God, yes, whiskey. <laughs> okay, that was a strong response. We're fine. We can still be friends. <laughs> What's your favourite drink? Uh, whiskey and soda. I used to like champagne, but I've developed an allergy to it, which is very oh. sad. <laughs> yeah. Very sad at all. Yeah. That's really so, tragic. So I, have to, I have to drink whiskey now, sad. So hard to have whiskey. It's a hard life. I know, life. I know. <laughs> That's the author life right there. Green tea by day, whiskey on the rocks with soda water at night. Yep. Yep. <laughs> if you could be described by one song, what would it be? Short people. I never heard <laughs> that song. <laughs> <laughs> Go, go Google that song, it's quite funny. Yeah, really? <laughs> I'm short. Sure that short. I am that short. I'm, I'm just over five foot. Maybe you've been that short. <laughs> I, I, I do wear shoes with heels. Yeah, you me by height because I think I'm not I'm sure she wasn't five foot. Okay. Yeah, yeah, just a five, five foot and half an inch. All right, it, it makes a difference. I it does. It does. <laughs> and what's your favourite animal? Dog. Dog. He's sitting right behind me. <laughs> is he your riding buddy? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> he is now that he has an injured paw and he can't walk around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. My oh, other, I mean, I had two other dogs who were my riding buddies. They, they used to sleep behind me and everything like that. But both of them died last year. So he's only a baby boy and he's still learning. <laughs> Give him a year or two. He'll be doing the same old man. Yeah, exactly. When he gets older. So do you have any um, exciting upcoming releases or anything else you want to sort of tell viewers? Um, I've got the sixth book of the Riley, uh, not Riley Jensen's, <laughs> Lizzie Grace series coming up uh, in June. That's out for pre-order now. So you learn lots of things in that book. So yeah. I think oh, they're really excited. <laughs> I, I have actually had such a good time speaking with you. Like I said, when I first met you at Riveting Reads, I loved you. I love your work. And I absolutely, absolutely oh, you. value everything that you've had to say today. So thank you so much for hopping on. Oh, thank you. Well, th thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> so I'm going to stop recording this and yep. then we will have a chat.